Glory to God. Look, my name's Jeff, but I'm a believer in recovery from drug addiction. I still struggle with a bunch of stuff, right? Praise God. Look, Paul told the Romans in Romans 13, 7, he said, look, man, if you, if you owe something, pay it, right? He said, if you owe taxes, pay your taxes, right? If you owe somebody, pay, pay them. If you owe somebody respect, give it. If you owe somebody honor, give it. And this guy, John Eklund, man, I got to tell you, the first time I ever saw John on stage, I think it was 2009, and I think you were a Silver Recovery State rep for West Virginia, and I saw him on stage, and I remember him. He was bigger than life, man. I just, I was in my early recovery. I remember him talking about a guy that was going to court, and, and John talked about going to court to be an advocate for him. I thought, who does that? You know, fast forward a couple of years, John became the regional director for the Northeast for Celebrate Recovery, and and we met at a summit in California, I think maybe in 2011. We became friends, and I was blown away that a guy like that would would be friends with a guy like me. And then John became the Celebrate Recovery Southeastern Regional Director, and I was a state rep in the Southeast, and I'll never forget in 2015 when John called me. I mean, we were, we were friends, but we didn't know each other very good, but he called me, and he said, hey, Jeff, how close do you live to Selma, North Carolina? I said, I'm about an hour away. He said, well, don't tell nobody, but I think I'm going to be moving to Selma, North Carolina. And I was blown away. So then John moved to Selma, and we began meeting halfway and having some coffee and talking. And, and he said, Jeff, why don't, you, why don't you come and be my co-leader of the Celebrate Recovery at Temple Church? I thought, why does this guy need me? I mean, he's bigger than life. This guy is amazing. Why does he need me? And then I remember... Later that year, we were in a leadership meeting, and there was this Spanish couple that John wanted to start a Spanish-speaking share group, and, and I'll never forget, John was kind of going around the room in this leader's meeting, and he got to them, and, and he was talking to them about this Spanish-speaking share group, and they said, but that's not what we want to do. And I'll never forget the look on John's face when they said that. And he said, you know... I'm busy trying to get you guys to do what I want you to do. And I haven't paid attention to what God's calling you to do, what you want to do. I'll never forget me and Pamela were there and we were on the on the trike. John asked me, he said, Jeff, if you could do anything, what what would you do? I said, I'd ride around the country on a motorcycle and share the gospel. And he said, Do it. Just do it. And I thought, you know, John saw something in me before I could see it for myself. And John is a guy that makes everybody around him feel special. And I think it's because he can see in people what they don't see in themselves. And he lifts us up in a way that I can't even explain. So I watched John go from regional director to national director, and then, and then a couple years ago, God used him to start a movement called Recovery Alive. I don't know that I've ever known anybody that has poured more into me that I've watched pour more into the people around him. And I am beyond honored and humbled to call him my friend. So come on, John. Let's hear what you got to say, brother. (laughs) 
I want to rip on Jeff, but I can't do it now. <laughs> Although when he's saying bigger than life, I think he called me fat. I don't know. <laughs> there's, uh, there's just some beautiful words about the relationship that David and Jonathan had. You read about their friendship, and um, I don't know that I've had a friend that's closer to that than, than you. Thank you. Thank you for being my friend. I'm not a, it's good, yeah, my name is John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with codependency and anger. All right, I'm in the right place. Um, so I was thinking about what uh, Jamie said, and I have to echo what he said about his pastors, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Andy. Thank you guys for what you do. This is a rare deal, man, that a church would embrace recovery so thoroughly. Um, got to hear Pastor Andrew's sermon. Uh, go back and listen to that if you yeah. get a chance. It's absolutely fantastic on uh, the illusion of control. Yeah. And, um, but I wanted to just piggyback off of what Jamie said. And it reminded me um, when he said there's a lot of churches where man, they, just, they don't want those people in the building. You know? yeah. um, I've, had, I've had people come up to me, uh, even at like Celebrate Recovery summits and things like that, and I remember one guy came up to me during the summit, um, I think it was about four, fourth or fifth summit I was at, and I, I was a state rep, I think, and he came up to me, and I had done a workshop or a teaching or something like that, and he said, hey, I got a question for you. He was in line and got up to me. He says, hey, he says, what if somebody, what if somebody comes to celebrate recovery for the wrong reason? <laughs> I'm like... Who goes to recover for the right reasons in the first place, right? <laughs> and then I've had people go, you know, I've had pastors say, like, you know, what, what do you do about, like, security? And I'm like, what do you mean security? They're like, you know, when, when recovery people start coming to your church, what? <laughs> people that look like that guy, you know? <laughs> You know, it's just like people, you know, they st they've got they got issues with like like sexual addiction and like like drugs. Like what do you do? I said, "Listen. People in recovery are the safest people on earth because they're telling other people yeah. about their issue." I said, "Though what you need to worry about is the fact that you already have people in your congregation who are doing it and they're not telling anybody about it." Yeah. Right? So Brennan, Brennan Manning, I don't know if you ever have read his Ragamuffin Gospel. Get, get a copy of that book. It's fantastic. But in Brennan Manning's book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, he wrote, the story goes that a public sinner was excommunicated and forbidden entry to the church. He took his woes to God, and he said, they won't let me in, Lord, because I'm a sinner. What are you complaining about, said God? They won't let me in either. <laughs> it's the least of these. He says, I am the least of these. You don't let in recovery people, you're not letting in Jesus. Amen. Right? Right. right? In Matthew, Matthew tells his own story of how he came into fellowship with Jesus. If you ever watch The Chosen, everybody watching The Chosen, you see Matthew's played by just a, what a great character, right? Well, he tells his own story about how he's, he's a sinner and he's a tax collector, the chief of sinners, just as bad as it gets, right? Traitor to his own people, the Romans hated him, the Jews hated him. And uh, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to just come out I'm going to hang out at your house if you don't mind. Um, said the same thing to another tax collector, Zacchaeus. He, Jesus, by the way, he would go where the sinners were, right? He wouldn't say, come to church. He'd say, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to go hang out with you. He met people where they were, amen? Right. So he's at, he's at the tax collector's house. Matthew's got some buddies over. In our world, it'd be like going to a kegger. I mean, honestly, like a preacher going to a kegger, right? And uh, I don't know if you know kegger is back in the day. <laughs> I was going to tell uh, the brother who's playing the piano, he's, 
uh, he's channeling Keith Green, but nobody knows who Keith Green is, right? Do you know who Keith Green is? Dude, everybody's like, ah, ha, ha, who the heck is that? <laughs> he's no longer with us. <laughs> yeah, he's fantastic. He'd be like 95 years old today. That's why we know who he is, yeah. Um, <laughs> So he's at this, uh, he's at, I mean, like a crack house. He's at like a, he's at a, he's at, he's at this house where a lot of partying and some foul words are probably happening. And these, these Pharisees see this all happening. These Pharisees, these teachers of the law, and they start whispering. You know how church people whisper? How they gossip. They're saying, hey, does he know who these people he's hanging out with are? And Jesus kind of goes alongside him. I can see him kind of talking to the Pharisee. He goes, hey, listen. I said, hey, it's cool. Healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick do. It's cool. It's cool. He says, listen, I didn't come, you know, for the righteous. But I came for, for the sinners. Now, let me ask you a serious question. Do you think he was calling the Pharisees healthy and righteous? No, because at one point in time, he called them a brood of vipers. That doesn't sound like righteous people to me. Another point in time, he says, you guys are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Does that sound healthy to you? That sounds like a bad diagnosis. I wouldn't want my doctor to say, man, I hate to tell you, you're full of dead men's bones. That's, that would be a bad x-ray. That would be a bad day. So he wasn't telling them, you're good. What he was saying was, only those who will admit that they're sick will I hang out with. You catch that? Only those people who will admit they're sinners will I hang out with. You might as well just stay out here. So while the church thinks a lot of times they're entertaining Christ, Christ is out there hanging out with the world. In recovery, we're trying to bring that all in here, where it belongs. We are the body of Jesus Christ. This is where healing happens. Amen? Amen. Recovery is not just for those people. Good job on Sunday. Trying to erase that stigma that recovery is just for drugs and alcohol. It's just for people with needles, you know, hanging out of their arm, and people, you know, who are who are porn fiends, and people who are just, you know, the real sinners. But that recovery is for everybody, and I want to just talk to you about why that is and what that looks like. There's a certainly there is a something inside of me when I, when I started Recovery Live where I was like, maybe I should call this ministry something else because recovery has this stigma. People think of something when they, when they think of the word recovery. They think, like, it's not about me. Like, recovery's not for me. That's for those 12-steppers, you know, the AA people. So how do, we, how, how do we bridge that gap and help people understand that recovery is for everybody? I, I just want you to know, like, if you've Hung around theological circles, there's this word called sanctification. And I kind of want to make the case that recovery is just a r- lot easier, less churchy way to say sanctification. Because I don't know if you know this, at least this is how it worked for me. Um, I, got, I got saved, like saved. In my early 20s, I was full-blown alcoholic at 21 years old. Had a double-barrel shotgun across my lap. Wanted to kill myself. In that upstairs apartment, I cried out to Jesus. He answered me. I had this incredible spiritual experience. And I lived happily ever after. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because it's ridiculous. And yet, the church many times, now I grew up in the church, I've been a pastor for a long time, so I can talk about the church this way. The church a lot of times throws it out there that, hey, listen, you just give your life to Jesus, 
and you're done. You're good. Punch your ticket, you're going to heaven. Walk into church, the greeter says, how you doing? You're like, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Even though I hate my wife and my children are driving me insane. In fact, I cussed them out on the way here. And they cussed back at me. I hate my job. I work for a jerk. There's a, there's a, uh, a book that we use when we come around this uh, confession part of our recovery process. It's a book of just a compilation of people who send in all the letters of confessions, the things they'd never told anybody before, that these terrible things that they've done or things that they've done to them, these secrets that they kept. And I like to pull that book out once in a while, and there's some really sad confessions that people wrote in, and some that are a little funnier. And, and this one older lady had sent in a confession. She said, sometimes when I get angry at my husband... I put boogers in his soup. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like, how long has she been doing that? Did she like stockpile them? You know, like, it's coming. He's going to tick me off some point in time. She's got a little bowl somewhere in her jewelry drawer, you know. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. We just sin different. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something hard. Sin in a coffee shop Saturday morning. I got a text. I had a girl doing so well, sober, had relapsed in the past, had overdosed many times in the past. She had months and months of sobriety. She came to her recovery life Friday night, and then later Friday night, she overdosed and died. And this is the best way I can honor her. I think, is to tell you this. She's no different than me. She's no different than you. I just want you to hear what, I, what I'm about to tell you. Is the only difference between that young lady and you and me is that when we sinned Friday night, it didn't kill us. That when we sinned Saturday, it didn't kill us. That's the only difference. Yeah. But surely it will. For the wages of sin is what? Yeah. The wages of sin is death. Whether it kills us now or later, we all have this thing called a sin problem. It's all going to get us. That's why we need a what? We all need a Savior. Are you guys okay with that theology? Yeah. yeah. Amen. And that surrendering to Jesus Christ is not a one-time decision, but surrender is a lifestyle. Yeah. Somebody asked me, is recovery in the Bible? Well, a pastor, yeah, I'm glad you asked. A pastor once told me, he says, let me, t let me tell you where recovery is in the Bible. He said, he said take your Bible your real Bible, your, not your phone. Take your Bible. <laughs> turn to Genesis 3. And then just grab these pages. He said, see this section right here? That's the recovery section of the Bible. Yeah, amen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this here, this is the recovery oh. section. Right there. So here's what I want to, 
I want to get to actually, this is just an introduction, so hey, get comfortable. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to start something that's just going to keep on rolling every week, every week, amen? Every week at the lake. Recovery Live at the lake. I love it. That sounds good. Rolls off the tongue. Recovery Live at the lake. And we start with step one. It's a good place to start. Step one, Pastor Andrew said, is it's about this idea that control is an illusion. I'm gonna, we're going to pop this up. Step one we call the power of weakness. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions, our compulsive behaviors, that our lives have become unmanageable. Do you have the scripture up there? I can read it right out of this book. If you don't have a book, Recovery Life, handbook. Power of weakness, step one, our scripture that goes around along with it is in, in Romans chapter 7, which is a fantastic recovery chapter. Go home, read it, read about Paul in chapter 7. Paul says, I want to do what's right, but I can't. Can't. In fact, in Romans 7, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. I see this thing, this war happening inside of me. Though I want to do what's right, evil is right there in me. That is in my sinful nature. You ever see the cartoon with the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other one? See, even the world knows that there's a war going on inside of you. Do you have those two voices? You're not schizophrenic. You're human. Well, most of you are. All right. You're human. You got the devil on one shoulder. You got the angel on the other shoulder, and they're warring with one another. And that's the human problem. Since the fall of man. If we were going to people groups tonight, we'd have a core question. It keeps us connected to application. I don't want you to just be hearers only, but I want you to be doers of the word. That's what the Bible says, right? You, tell me what the foundation is of Christianity. Do you guys know it's not the Bible? The foundation of Christianity isn't the Bible. It's not Jesus. Don't call me a heretic. I'm going to use Jesus' actual words. He's going to tell you what found, the very foundation of Christianity is. He says, the one who built his house on the rock is the one who hears these words of mine and does them. It doesn't help to listen and not do it. Francis Chan, you all know Francis Chan, is a great preacher, tells a story about a dad who tells his son, he says, son, your room is a wreck. Anybody relate to that? Anybody relate? Your room is a wreck. You're a slob. Clean it. His teenage son goes, hmm, that's good. Dad, that's good. That's good. Hey, I'm going to write that down. Can I write that down? Dad's like, I'm going to kill you. He says, just let me, he says, let me just write that down. Clean your room. It's a wreck. He goes up into his room. He's up there for a while. Dad's going, okay, maybe he's getting some stuff done. All of a sudden, some of his buddies come over. They're like, hey, we're just here to see your son. You mind if we go up? He says, great, he got some help. Fantastic. They all go. They're up in the room. They're up in the room for hours. All of a sudden, he hears his son. He's playing the guitar. They're up there singing. They're up there for hours. They come downstairs. They're crying. They're crying. They've got tears pouring down their face. They're glowing. The dad goes, what happened in that room? He goes up into that room, opens the, opens the door, looks in, and what? The room is what? It's a wreck. The dad storms down the stairs. They're all Gathered around the kitchen, eating, talking, fellowshipping. Dad says, what were you guys doing? He says, man, you... I wrote down what you said. So good. <laughs> I read it over and over, and then I memorized it. I want to keep it right here inside of me. 
I got so excited about it, I called some friends over. We decided to study it. <laughs> we looked it up in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Latin. We prayed over it. We sang songs about it. Thanks, Dad. But guess what? The room was still a wreck. That's what I'm afraid of, even in recovery circles, is that we don't apply. We don't take what's given to us in the Word. We, we don't take this truth and, and, and apply it to our lives. So we have these things called core questions. The core question I want to give you, I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to think about it. Okay? I want you to ask yourself this question. How are you guarding your heart against denial? And I want to just keep that up the whole time, if you don't mind. Let's just keep that up there the whole time. How are you guarding your heart against denial? And I'm here to tell you, in step one, the very first thing we have to believe, not just regarding recovery, but just about ourselves, is that we have this incredible capacity for denial as human beings. We have an amazing capacity for denial as human beings. Some of you heard this story before. My best story about denial is my daughter, Daisy. She's a firstborn, just got married. God help me. Yeah, clap it up, buddy. <laughs> clap it up. Instead of clapping, can we just take an offering real quick? I rest. <laughs> Send the plate around. Hey, it's my second one. God of mercy. I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable. Yes. So, Daisy, she's six-year-old firstborn. She is like a rule follower. And we've got really busy through street that we live on in West Virginia. And there's a sign that we told the kids, like, listen, you you can ride your bikes, but you can't go past this one like street sign because it's just too busy down there. You, you can't do it. Well, she's on her bike. My wife is outside watching her, and she blows by that sign. And my wife gets the mom voice going. You know, you know the mom voice I'm talking about? She's like, Daisy! Daisy keeps on rolling. My wife storms down the front steps of the house, and she's like, Daisy! Daisy keeps rolling. My wife, one more time, she, man, not just the voice, but the face, you know, the mom face, and she's like, Daisy, and Daisy finally turns around, starts wheeling back up the sidewalk. My wife's about to light into her, and you can see Daisy's little mind spinning. I can imagine it in my head, and before my wife can say anything, my daughter yells out, I'm sorry, mom, I didn't hear you the first two times. Yeah. I was heading back here from Alabama. True story. Come back from Alabama. How many of y'all, do y'all use the Google? The Google Maps? Yeah, the Google. The Walmart and the Google and all the... If you use the Google, is it pretty, pretty reliable? You guys pretty happy with the Google Map? Yeah, yeah. I get a little iffy, but it's pretty, you know. So I'm driving back from Alabama. I'm just passing south of the border. Have you been to south of the border? Is there stuff that's actually happening there? It looks like Las Vegas. And I'm just, I wanted to pull over, but, huh? But I'm like looking really close and like there's no cars there. There's just lots of lights. I see a lot of people going like this. No, I don't know. I really want to go in there one of these days. Okay, sorry, I digress. So I pass out the board, and I keep going, and I've got, I'm getting closer, i got about an hour, 15 minutes, almost to Fayetteville, and all of a sudden, the Google <laughs> says, exit, 301, exit. I'm like, what in the world? I turn Google off. I turn it back on. It's like, exit now, exit. And I'm like, No. I just want to stay on 95. Just keep on rolling. Well, what happens? I go past that exit. Traffic is stop. It's a parking lot. 
And Google goes, told you. <laughs> she actually said that. No, she didn't. <laughs> True story. It took four. Has anybody been south of Fayetteville? How bad? It, it's just like terrible right now. Am I right? It's insanity. And then when you start to clear out, there's nothing there. Like there's no, I'm like, I can't, I don't even know who to be mad at. There's nothing there. So I go another 15 minutes or so. Google goes, Nancy. Again. You know what I do? No. <laughs> Swear. I see nothing but 95. I don't see a, I just keep, I'm like, I'm right this time. I want to be at least 50. I want to be 500 on this thing. I keep rolling. Guess what? <laughs> Definition of insanity. I hit traffic worse than the first. Here's what I want to tell you. I want you to hold out your left hand. Just do this right here. Okay. I want you to hold a scripture in your hand. Jeremiah 17, 9. Okay? Say it. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Some of you aren't even listening to me. I'm not Google. Hey, put your hand up. Put that hand up. Jeremiah 17, 9. Hold that scripture in your hand. Do you believe it? Yeah. Look at it. Just take a look at it real quick. What does that mean? What does it mean? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? It means there's nothing in existence is lying, cheating, betraying, deceitful as your heart. Isn't that a sad reality? All right, you can put your hand up. Do you, do you believe that's true? Some of us. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. The devil is a liar, yeah? yeah. But guess what? Nobody lies like I can lie to myself. Most of the time, I'm just agreeing with the devil because I, it's already there. We got three enemies that we deal with in Christianity. We got the devil, we got the world, but man, this one. Nothing like this one because he's with me every day and he lies. He lies. He's a liar. Humor me one more time. Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart. Say it. Guard your heart. For it is the wellspring, For it is the wellspring of life. Hmm. Take a look at that. Wellspring means it's the source. Your heart is the source of all life. It's where everything comes from. All of your actions, all of your words from the overflow. Pastor of the heart, your what? Mouth speaks. Guard it. For it's the wellspring of life. All right, put these two together. How do we reconcile this? When the heart is deceitful and it's the wellspring of life, how, what do we do with that? What do we do? <laughs> it's a bad situation. You're just like Paul. Remember, when Paul wrote Romans 7, he was, at that time, one of the greatest Christians in existence. Wrote half of the New Testament. And he's saying, Paul's saying, what a wretched man I am. Not was. What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death, he says. Because the heart is deceitful. And he's in, a, he's in a conundrum. He's in a dilemma because if the heart's deceitful, but yet it's also the source of life, what do I do? How do I guard it if it's constantly lying to me? If 
I know the truth, and the truth sets me free. And God is like Google. God is like going, exit. And I'm like, I think I got this. Thank you very much. <laughs> what do I do? Really quickly. There's a story. You guys know it really well. About David. I just want you to understand. David is a superhero. He's phenomenal. The greatest king in the history of Israel. David, the giant killer. Right? David, the commander of the mighty ones, his mighty men, people who would... I mean, they would crawl over glass to just bring David a glass of water. You remember that? Do whatever it took because David was so beloved. He was a superstar. And yet, you know the story. Something happened. What happened to David? I want to tell you what happened to David. It wasn't Bathsheba. It was his heart. And you're all, we're all capable of the same thing. If David could do it, I promise you, you can do it. Here's what happened. In the spring when kings are supposed to be at war. How about that? That's a good opener because kings are supposed to be in battle. Did you know that you are a child of the king? Did you, didn't we sing that? Can I get an amen? Are you a child of the king? Amen. I know it's getting late. <laughs> You're a child of the king. Here's what I want you to know. You can never, ever stop battling. You can never sit back and take it easy spiritually. There aren't any breaks spiritually. There's no sabbaticals spiritually. There's no rest until we get to heaven and he says, welcome to your rest. Your rest is there, it's not here. Amen. You can't rest. Because the devil is relentless. Amen. Did you know God has a plan for your life? Yes. I want you to also know the devil has a plan yes. for your life too. I promise you. And he's trying to do three things. To kill you, to steal what you got, and destroy your every, every plan and every effort. And if you're not on it spiritually... Physical rest is a part of a spiritual discipline. I'm not telling you not to take a Sabbath and not to take it easy at times, but spiritually you cannot stop being disciplined spiritually. That's, what's, that's what recovery is all about. All right. In the spring when kings are supposed to be at war, David sent Joab with his officers. So you guys go ahead. They went out and they beat everybody up. But one evening, David got up from his bed, and it says he strolled around on the roof of the palace. How many get you get in trouble when you don't have a whole lot to do? That's why we say, get to meetings. Go to meetings. <laughs> 90 and 90, baby. Go to church every time the doors are open, because you'll get in trouble if you don't. I promise you. Strolling around on the roof, he sees a woman bathing. Nothing wrong. Don't blame the victim. Bathsheba is the victim here, by the way. I won't get into all the theology here, but bathing very clearly. She's at the end of her cycle, so she's bathing, doing what women were supposed to do back then. She didn't do anything wrong. He approaches her. Can't say no to the king. Some would even go as far as saying there, this might be a rape situation. I mean, it's ser this is serious stuff, man. David is doing some nasty stuff. He uses his power. David sent someone to inquire about her. This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam. He never was mistaken because he was informed she is the wife of Uriah. She's married. Guess what he should have done right there? Called his sponsor. Woo, just saw a woman bathing. <laughs> Can we meet at uh, 
Denny's? I don't think they had a Denny's back then. Huh? <laughs> David sent messengers, go get her. And when she came to him, he slept with her. Then she said, I'm pregnant. Oh. Right then, David should have maybe called a sponsor. <laughs> David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> By the way, hey, could you, uh, could you send me Uriah? Go down to your house, wash your feet. Uriah left the palace. A gift from the king followed him. Uriah slept at the door of the palace, all his master's servants. He didn't go down to his house because Uriah was a better man than David. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home. David questioned Uriah, haven't you come home from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered David, the ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents. My master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my own house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? See, David was trying to get him to sleep with his wife. He was trying to cover up his sin. Control is an illusion. David was trying to control something that was out of control. And when we feel out of control, we make bad mistakes the worst thing we can do is double down on control because we'll just keep making mistakes, and that's what happened. He gets himself in a big old mess, and pretty soon he does something absolutely despicable. Since Uriah would not go along with his manipulation, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent with Uriah. In the letter he wrote, put Uriah at the front of the fiercest fighting and then withdraw So that he is struck down and dies. Just so you don't have any misconceptions about what's to happen, he needs to die. Of course, he was. Uriah's wife heard that her husband died. She mourned for him. David had her brought to his house. It's sick. It's sick. Comforted her. Oh, come on. I'll take care of you. I just don't want you to get any misconceptions. David is just sick. It's nasty business. How did this happen? How did David get so lost in his sin? David, I think, did three things that led to his demise. Number one, he stopped fighting. He stopped fighting. Number two, he isolated. I don't see anybody else hanging around with him. He's all alone up on that roof. He isolated. How many of you, isolation's a killer? Third, he fell into pride. He started playing God. Pride is a killer. Here's how he got back on, on track. And then we'll close this out. The Lord sent Nathan. Hmm. How many of you know that there are people out there who are Jesus with skin on? Yes. Yeah. Thank God. Hey. But you got to listen to him. Nathan made sure he was. He told him a story. He said, there's two men in a city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a number of sheep, cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one small lamb. It lived and grew up with him and his children. It shared his meager food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Nathan is not pulling any punches. A traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man couldn't bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare. The traveler had come to him and said he took the poor man's lamb. And he prepared it for his guests. In other words, he killed it and let this guest eat it. It's like eating one of his children. David was infuriated when he heard this story. As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. And Nathan replied to David, what? You are that man. You? and suddenly that denial is shattered the illusion of control is shattered and David says oh my heart is deceitful oh. 
He does these three C's. He confesses. He confesses. What a wretched man I am. You know, when the Catholics instituted, we give the Catholics a hard time, but they did something beautiful. When they instituted confession, a revival broke out. We're bad at confession. We don't even have a mechanism for it in the Protestant church. We do in recovery. It's called people groups. Confess your sin one to another so you can be forgiven. No, no. James says so you can be healed. There's healing in confession. When's the last time you opened up and shared what you are capable of, what you've done? Pain shared is pain lessened. When you confess your sin, you're free. When you confess your struggle, you're free. Confession. He confesses. He allows confrontation. If somebody confronts you, you, do you get defensive? Do you get angry? Do you get frustrated? Or do you say, you know what? Maybe there's something here I need to listen to. How do you do with confrontation? David embraced that confrontation. He accepted it. He confessed. And then the last thing he did, and it's very sad, he accepted that there were consequences for his sin. That baby died, and it was David's fault. And he couldn't stop it. He prayed, he fasted, he did everything he knew how to do, tore his clothes. But he accepted that there were consequences. That's recovery. It's not for addicts. It's not for alcoholics, truly screwed up people. It's for all of us because we're all screwed up. We all need a process. A process that takes us from that place where David was as a, as a child chosen by God. And it takes us to a place of maturity and moves us day by day from glory to glory, the Bible says. But if we let stuff slide, when we start to say, hey, I don't need this anymore. I think i got to figure it out. We're in big trouble. And that's recovery, is staying in surrender. Will you say that? Staying in surrender. I'm going to close with this and have our musician come back up. My dad... 70 years old, he starts getting into recovery. <laughs> he needs it. <laughs> and he watches online, and online you can see all the people come into the altar on Friday night at Temple City Church. You have 400 people on Friday night. We got 100 people at the altar every Friday. And my dad, bless you, my dad, he's just kind of a critical guy at times. He can be kind of cynical. And he admitted to me, he says, John, he said, I got to tell you, he said, I see these people at the altar. He says, I feel like I must have seen the same people every Friday, man. There are people at the, at the altar, the same people every Friday. And he says, when are they going to get it? <laughs> he said, you know what? The Holy Spirit hit me as I've been working my process group. The Holy Spirit hit me and says, you don't get it. He said, going to the altar isn't a one-time thing. Amen. The people who go to the altar, every shot they get are the ones who get it. That's right. That you never stop needing a Savior. That the further you, you get into your Christianity, the more you're going to be at the altar. Amen. The closer you get to God, the more you know you need Him. The further you get into who you are as a person, the more you know, I need a Savior. I'm a mess, but I can be 
perfected if I stay close to the one who makes me perfect. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and I just got to stay close, stay close to him. That's recovery, is just staying in surrender. Stay there. So what's that core question? How's your heart? Can we put that core question back up there? How are you guarding your heart against denial? How are you staying in surrender? How are you staying in the fight? Or have you kind of let go? Have you slacked off a little bit? Are you committed not to church, not to reading your Bible, not to a daily devotional plan, but a desperate need for God? You see, when he went to the Pharisees and had this conversation with them about prayer, he said, man, there's two kinds of people. There's the Pharisee who's saying, at least I'm not like those people down there. You remember this? He says, I don't, I'm not going to, they, they've got their reward. I, they shouldn't expect to receive anything. The person's prayer I'm going to honor is the one who is crying out desperately, I'm a sinner. I need help. Save me. That's the one that he responds to. Not once, but every single time that I am Always a man in need of a Savior. John Eklund, I lead recovery life, but I need recovery. I need it, and I need a Savior. I need Thee. Lord, I need Thee. Every hour, I need Thee. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, I need You. Do you need Him? Oh, God. Every hour. God, I need you. Yeah, let's play that. Would you stand to your feet? Lord, I confess. That I need you. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I've wandered. I confess that sometimes I don't want to fight. Sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I want to just do my own thing. Sometimes pride runs away with me. Sometimes I get road rage. Sometimes I get mad at my wife. Sometimes I lose it on my kids. Sometimes I lust. Sometimes I want to go back to my old life. Sometimes I ignore people. Sometimes I isolate. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Do you need him? Not just want him. Do you need him? Do you feel the need? Those who thirst, I'll give you water where you'll never thirst again. Are you hungry? You say, I don't need a thing, but you don't know in Revelation. He says, you're blind, you're naked. You don't know. You think you got everything. You say, I'm rich, but you're poor. You got nothing. Oh, God. How I need you, Lord. I need you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you right now in this place, you say, I have to admit, man, I've, I've gotten a little self-sufficient. Maybe I've gotten a little tied up in my own life. I've, I've struggled sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm not fighting like I need to fight. I'm wandering a bit here and there. I just want to return to my first love, man. I want to go after it. I want to thirst and hunger for God like I, like I did at the beginning, like I did when I first, first cried out to Him. I want to know that first love like I knew from the start. I want to get back to that place. I want that fire again. I want to know that I know that I know that I need a Savior. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, I want that again, man. I want to surrender one more time tonight. I want to get to that altar, man. I need you, God. We've got surrender chips up here at the altar. And if you want that, if you want to say, man, this chip tonight, I'm going to take this chip as a reminder that I'm not going to just surrender tonight, but I'm going to stay in surrender tomorrow morning when I wake up, tonight when I lay down my head. 
This afternoon, when I, a little bit later, when I get in my car and drive home, I'm going to stay in surrender. I want you to come to this altar. I want you to take one of these surrender chairs. I want you to bow a knee, and I want you to say, God, fill me with your spirit. Give me that fire again, God. I want you. I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. Just come right now. Come to this altar. Grab one of these chips, and let's just pray together. Let's gather right here at this altar. If you raised your hand, even if you didn't, come on. Get one of these chips and say, I want to stay in surrender. I want to live in recovery. I want to be a disciple. I don't want to just pretend. I want to go out and I want to change the world for him. I want to be on fire for him like I was at the beginning. God, I need you. I need you, Lord, I need you. Just come on, let's pray together. Let's surrender and surrender and surrender. Lord, I need you. 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 in every heart I worship you I worship you you are here you're healing every life I worship you I worship you you are here turning lives around I worship you I worship you you are here you're mending every heart I worship you I worship you
when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you're my. We make a miracle work, a promise keep a light in the darkness. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Praise you, God. Do you believe it? Even when we don't see it, He's working. Amen. But are we still working? You don't have to earn it. But it is an effort. <laughs> he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. we got to remain. I don't always do this, but I just feel like remaining is sometimes the hardest thing. Taking a hill is one thing, but keeping it is another, isn't it? And some of you have been on that hill ministering. You've taken a hill in your marriage or you've taken a hill in your recovery, but you're tired. You're so tired. You've thought about quitting in one way or another. You're just like, I don't know how long I can keep this hill. And I know we've already had some prayer, but man, I just, I think there's some discouraged people, some people in this place who are just tired. I wonder if you just if you'd be willing to just come to this space right here and, and just be prayed over. I want to encourage you. We're supposed to encourage each other as long as it's called today so you're not hardened, the word says, by sin's deceitfulness. And I can just feel it, man. There's some people who are just, you're bone tired, man. And you need some encouragement. I just want to pray encouragement over you. So is there anybody that would come and just join me right here? At the, you're just, oof, oof. Feel it, guys. Feel that discouragement. Feel it. Let yourself feel it. So when you feel that discouragement, and you go, I can't do it anymore, that's when God says, my power can be made perfect in your weakness. So it's not about hiding your weakness. It's about saying, I admit, I can't do it anymore. And then God says, good, good, good. Now I can do something. You don't have to do this. He says, I've got rest for you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My burden is light. Grab a shoulder. Grab a hand. Let's encourage each other. God, your power is perfect right now. It's perfect. Because these people right here have declared they can't do it. They're wore out. They're bone, spirit tired. They've reached the end of their rope, Lord. And you're saying, let go. Let go. Let go. Just let go. You don't have to do it. I am your God. I am your God. 
You can't part the sea. What are you trying to part the sea for? I can part the sea. Just raise up your hands and surrender, and I will do miracles and wonders like you've never seen. I am your God. Humble yourself, and I will lift you up. I pray encouragement to the discouraged. Empowerment by your spirit that they would know the fullness according to Ephesians 3. The fullness, the full measure of your Holy Spirit would fill them. And they would do what you've called them to do. You will not leave them as orphans. You won't. Thank you, God, for their yes. Now I pray you would empower their yes right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen, amen. Let's give God some praise in this place, amen? All right. I think we need the serenity prayer, huh? Good golly. Will you guys join me and we'll say the serenity prayer and then uh, we'll do some fellowshipping. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life supremely happy with you. Amen. Let's praise God one more time, Pastor Jeff. Well, how many of you believe that we met with God tonight? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. So glad you're here. Listen, would you like to have this every Monday night in your life? Amen. We invite you to come back. I, uh, Jeff and, 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 and where it was you know, with uh, it, it, right before the service, and um, I told him, I said, listen, I am the president of Jeff's fan club, <laughs> and he said, well, that's not a big deal. You're probably the only member, you know, <laughs> so uh, listen, what a great time. We heard from God, but here's the question, are we going to do it, amen? So we want to invite you to come back every Monday night. If you enjoyed it tonight, come on, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise together. Amen. If you see fit on the way out, if you would like to give a little love offering and to help to offset some of the cost of the food and all that, uh, you're welcome to do that. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you guys for coming to the lake tonight. It's been good to be together. Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you, Father, Lord, that um, you don't want us to be just hearers of the word. We did hear the word, but you want us to be doers of the word, Father, to walk by faith, to trust you, Father. And Lord Jesus, there is no thing like a place where lives can be changed in Jesus. Make this that place on Monday nights, Father, here in Fayetteville, where lives can come, be changed for the glory of God. You love us just like we are, but you love us so much that you don't want us to stay just like we are. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for this evening. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next Monday night. <laughs>